staff members, check your email real quick. I just sent you a new sermon. <laughs> Praise God. If you didn't get it, ask somebody else and they'll send it to you. So I know you got a handout. We're going to talk about the power of salvation. Hang on to that. We're going to talk about that some other time. So I kept hearing a certain word throughout the service, and I thought, well, okay, well, okay. And then on, uh, I think it was Thursday. I don't, I don't know what is today Sunday. Okay, good Sunday. Yeah, it was Saturday. Notre Dame won yesterday for the first. So I do remember that. Uh, so if you haven't been here in a long time um, or been here, maybe this is your first year, first five years, and uh, maybe I have not told this story. I, I don't think I've told the story since before COVID, and COVID owes us three years of our lives back. And uh, so you shall not die, but you shall live and declare the works of the Lord. So. Because everything the enemy steals from you, he has to return sevenfold. So I'll take another 21 years on top of that. So um, when I first started pastoring, and I, I'm going to get to my sermon, but I want to give you an idea of, of why I'm so passionate about this. When I first started pastoring, uh, I pastored to not do certain things because I was a product of a ministry failure. My pastor had a moral failure that made the headlines of every newspaper in the town that we were in. And so when I do baby dedications, I do baby dedications, and our baby dedications are designed for uh, that, with that thing in mind, that I will serve in the office of pastor with honor, with integrity, because I'm talking to a child that's going to grow up under my ministry. And I want to ensure to the parents that they can feel safe raising their child under my ministry that I'm gonna serve in the office of pastor with honor and with integrity. And so we make those commitments and I have to do it all the time. So I have to, you know, remind myself that that's the commitment. And so when Aaron was talking about falling asleep, sometimes we, we say things and we make promises and we make commitments, we make vows years ago and then we forget them. And we forget what got us here and what got you in the place you are. So sometimes you have to be reminded of who you are, the commitment that you need to make, and you need to stay making that commitment on a daily basis. Uh, I'm well aware of what's going on in our community. I'm well aware of what's going on in a, the, some other churches. Uh, so uh, I got a unique vantage point uh, Last Sunday night when I wasn't preaching and I got to see some things, uh, when our children are in the room, they're still our responsibility. When we're here on Friday nights and doing worship, uh, for instance, uh, we were here a couple of Friday nights ago doing courtyard worship and there were kids all by themselves on the other side of the building, all by themselves on the other side of the building. And I don't know who the neighbors are. So when you were here, the kids are your responsibility as much as they are ours. It's not, it's going to get tight in here. It's okay. This is called pastoring. And uh, so, you know, we, we do our best, but it is up to all of us to be guardians of godliness, guardians of the culture of our house. So if you see something, your first duty is to say something. And the Bible tells you who to say it to. Say it to them. Hey, what you're doing right there, that's not right. That's not appropriate. That's not good behavior. If they don't receive that, then you go get an elder and you bring the elder to them and then you talk to them. And then most people want to involve me first. And I have no problem getting involved, but it usually doesn't end well. Because if folks didn't take it from you and they didn't take it from an elder, that means they're all, their heart's already hard and they're already rebellious, which is going to lead to me having to openly rebuke them, which means I'm going to get behind this pulpit and say, uh, Sister so-and-so is, and usually people don't want that. But that's called biblical correction. <laughs> 
And we need a whole lot more correction starting in the home. Okay? So, I don't know if I believe all that. I don't know. Well, look at our world today, and you're seeing what our world is right now because people won't stand up and say something. Oh, you can just be whatever you want to be. No, you're going to be what God called you to be. Oh, you can just do whatever you're going to do. No, no, you're not going to do whatever you want to do. In this house, you're going to be it because nothing good ever happens after 11 o'clock. So I want to empower some of you parents to parent. Oh, I just wanted to be accepted. No, I wanted to be saved. And what's happening is, is you're backing up off of your own authority. And if you don't use your authority, somebody's going to take your authority from you and they're going to use it against you. So I, you're going to read this whole sermon. You're going to read it in January because I wrote you a devotion about legacy. I want, to, I want our legacy as a church to be that we did not give up our authority. We have taken authority over Southern Illinois, over this region, to have revival. And you, you, you are fooling yourself if you think that the enemy is going to let us take back his territory and not put up a fight or not try to take, make an attack or do something else. So you, you think, well, we're in revival. The only way you can stay in revival is if you guard the revival. The only way you can keep a move of God is if you guard the things that brought about the move of God. And authority is the number one thing. You have to take authority. I will not tolerate cancer. I will not tolerate sugar diabetes. I will not tolerate these diseases or sin. Why? Because we have authority over those things. And the minute we start saying, oh, you know what? It's just, it, it's just, it'll oh, be okay. My grandma had it, my dad had it, and my sister had it, and I'm gonna get it. No, take authority and make it in with you. Take authority over it. So I, I believe one of the number one reasons why Christians do not live out their destiny is they are intimidated. I'm not intimidated. When I get the anointing, I'll, I'll, I don't care how big you are. I don't care what the enemy is doing. I don't care what the cancer diagnosis is. You cannot be intimidated off of what you believe. Intimidation. And I think many of us, we want to talk about the symptoms of problems. That's our whole society right now. We don't want to talk about the symptoms of problems instead of dealing with root issues of, issue, of problems. And, and when we don't want to deal with the, we only want to do the symptoms of it, then we are prevented from moving forward from our, our dreams and our destinies. And so intimidation just simply means this, to compel or to deter by threats. To compel you to do something differently than you wanted to do or to deter you by using threats like this. Well, if you take that stand, I'll inflict you with cancer. If you do that, your kids are going to do this. If you do that, it's going to cost you something. If you, the enemy whispering all kinds of thoughts to compel you or to deter you by threats. Now, just so you don't think I'm holier than you, there have been times in my life that I have certainly dealt with intimidation. I've dealt with intimidation. I, I have dealt with feeling like the world is stacked against me. Anybody else ever felt that way? Usually on Monday mornings after a sermon like I'm getting ready to preach, I, I have felt that nothing is going to go right. I'm going to fail. I'm going to be embarrassed. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm underqualified, I'm not qualified, I'm disqualified, all those things. You don't think that those thoughts don't go through my mind every single Sunday? But at some point, you cannot be deterred by the threat that the enemy is placing into your life. And you've got to step up and do the will of God for your life. And you've got to step up and go against all of that intimidation. We would say maybe it's overcoming your fears. But what's behind that fear? Because the Bible does talk about a spirit of fear. But God did not give you the spirit of fear. He gave you one of power, of love, and of a sound mind. So behind that spirit of fear is the enemy of your soul who is intimidating you to to deter you away from what you desire to do or he's compelling you to do something different than what you originally set out to do. Intimidation. So I deal with it. I'm sure Pastor Melissa deals with it. 
And so when I was in the corporate world, if you don't know this, I was a corporate executive before I was a pastor. My success was the byproduct of my fear of failure. I felt like the most underqualified. I mean, I was 25 years old. I was the youngest executive there. I, everybody else had master's degrees and PhDs. And I'm just this little boy from South Bend, Indiana, who did not even have a college education. But you know what? Can y'all just pardon my South Bend vernacular for a minute? I kicked their rear ends from one end of this country to the next. And then they said, hey, man, what's the key to your success? And I, and I, I had a choice, right? I could say, I've been reading all these business books, and I was reading Rockefeller Habits, and, I, and I've read all those. But my key to success was on Monday night, my church had a prayer meeting. And when I got into that prayer meeting, I prayed the prayer of Jabez over my sales territory, over all my sales reps, over all my man. Managers. I prayed over them every week. So they asked me in the Bahamas, would you tell us what the key of your success is? I said, on Monday night, my church has a prayer meeting and I pray over my territory. I pray over my sales reps. I pray over every contract. The only way I'm here is by prayer. And these things only come about by fasting and prayer. So I love your system, I love your sales process, but the only reason why I can put two words together is my God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he owns all the gold that is in them and his will is to bless me and to bring me to his expected end. Y'all, some of y'all get intimidated about the favor of God over your life. Man, favor ain't fair. That's why they call it favor. But as a child of God, you have favor over your life. And you shouldn't apologize that God has blessed you. Oh, look at them. No, no, look at him. I have what I have because of him. So I think sometimes we, we get into this fear of failure and we think, uh, we think more about the repercussions of failure then we talk, talk about the repercussions of successes. We want to talk about the repercussions of what happens, you know, if I don't do it. Well, what happens if you do? What happens if you do go lay hands on the sick and they recover? See, the repercussion, if you don't do it, they're not going to recover. You already know that prophecy. But if you lay hands on the sick, they recover. And so you get ready to go pray for somebody and the enemy's like, well, I don't know if you should do that and don't, uh, because he's backing you out of your authority and you need to walk in your authority. You need to walk in and not just walk in authority, exercise your authority. Because there's a whole lot of people say, I'm a parent, but never exercise the authority of a parent. You got the title of a parent, but your kids don't respect you as a parent. But you exercise that authority and they'll walk in your authority. And I know some of you probably thought, I wonder if he beats his kids. <laughs> I think Morgan, when she was two years old, I smacked her hand one time. And I think Zoe, in her life, she says she's gotten two. She's mistaken. She's gotten one. But my kids know. Matter of fact, we were driving home the other night and there was some craziness going on and Zoe said, Dad, you would never allow us to act like that. I said, you bet your bottom dollar if you acted like that, I'd knock you out. Yeah. I'd have never knocked her out, but she knows, don't talk to your mama like that. Don't you treat the house of God like that. Don't you treat the people of God like that. You need to have some honor and some respect and some integrity in your life. If you don't show up to work and you're lying, I'm going to call you out on it because my daughter is going to do it as unto the Lord. Yeah. Exercise some authority. This is going to be a number one hit right here. Walk in your authority. Exercise your authority. And because in spiritual terms, God has given you that authority to walk in it and to exercise it. If you don't do it, someone's going to take it and use it, and usually against you. And not only will they use it against you, they're gonna use it against other people too. Let's look at a conversation. Now, keep in mind, I had to write this really quickly, so I'm gonna use the King James Version because that's the way my brain thinks. Luke chapter four, verses five through seven. And the devil, 
And they probably don't have this on the screens because I, I sent them an email 30 seconds before I walked on the stage. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him, look at that, they're amazing. Showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So he shows him, this is right after Jesus got baptized, the heavens opened, there was a voice from heaven, the devil takes him into a high mountain, he shows unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, for that is is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be mine. Now that's an interesting little thing. I thought all power in heaven and earth was in Christ's hand. Well, the enemy has some authority because somebody back in the book of Genesis did not walk in and did not exercise their authority. So their authority was taken from them and then used against them and then it has been used against people all through the Old Testament, all the way to the cross of Calvary, it was used against them. Now that we're past the cross of Calvary, the enemy is still thinks he has that authority. He does not have that authority. Jesus took that authority back from him and gave it to the church. So he, when he tells you, hey, if you'll do this, I'll give you some authority, he doesn't have any authority to give to you. He has been stripped of his authority and you actually have the authority and you need to run him out instead of him running you out. I just don't know, man, if we have church, people are gonna do this and we have revival, this is gonna happen. That's, how, that's because we stand here in fear and intimidated. If we'll take a stand for God, listen, the enemy can't do anything to me, to you, this church or this revival unless we allow him to do it. I'm preaching better than some of you want because some of you like church failure. Some of you like your family failure. But if you take authority over it, you will not be a failure. You will go on to go from glory to glory and from faith to faith. But you've got to take authority over it and stop backing up and backing down and being a Sunday Christian. Take authority on Monday. Take authority on Tuesday. Command your Wednesday. Be thankful for your Thursday and throw him out on Friday that way you don't have to come to church on Sunday and repent over everything you've done on Saturday take authority over it now that word he said all this power in verse 6 all this power that word power there is exousia it means the sense of of ability. Usually we would say power is dunamis, but here's the word exusa. It's the sense of ability. It means force, capacity, competency, freedom, or mastery. It means the King James word would be authority or jurisdiction, liberty, power, right, or strength. Now, if we have power, if we have authority, that's just not dynamite power to throw things up, blow things up. But we have the right to have jurisdiction. We have right to control what goes on. In other words, we take authority over this region and we command the spirit of suicide to leave in Jesus' name. We command this drug addiction to leave in Jesus' name. Take authority. We have jurisdiction over it. So whatever goes on around it, we have the authority over it. Now, trust me, I'm going to get an email later on today. You're a word of faith guy. Well, why aren't you? Because the just shall live by faith. So in this little text in Luke chapter 4 that I read to you, you're seeing the picture, picture of a decision, a decision that Adam and Eve made. It was a decision they made. Okay, we can blame a lot of things on demons. But Eve was not devil possessed. Adam was not devil possessed. They made a decision. And a lot of things that we blame the devil on is our flesh. We make a decision. And when you make a decision, your decision has consequences. 
When you make a decision, there are ramifications to every decision that goes on. Like, I, cha- I made a decision to change my sermon. Out of that, there are all kinds of consequences and all kinds of ramifications that happen, right? We recorded videos, we did this, we did that, and I just changed everything with one decision. And that has a domino effect down the line of all the things because I made a decision. Equally true, when you make a decision, it has a domino effect, whether it be good or whether it be bad. When you make a decision to open up that chat box and begin to talk to that woman who is not your wife, that decision has a consequence and has ramification but if you say listen I don't do private messages I don't answer that kind of stuff I don't even get in a car with a woman who's not my wife I don't go out to lunch alone with a woman I do all those things those things equally have consequences I'm happily married I can sleep with both eyes closed if I open up the chat box I'd be happy with half my stuff It all has consequences. So when you don't take authority right now, when your child's three and four, and you think that rebellious attitude is cute, and you encourage that behavior, that has a ramification, and it has a consequence. If they won't respect your authority, then they won't respect his authority. If they don't respect their elders, they'll never do it. If you talk down about the preacher and the church, don't expect your children to say, boy, wasn't church good and we got the best pastor and when they get in trouble, they're not gonna run to me. They're gonna run to where you have encouraged them to run because everything has a consequence. So they made a decision. My question is, what decisions are you making? Oh, pastor, you just got it easy. You're the pastor of the church. Are you kidding me? Do you know how much the enemy would love to knock me out? Do you know how much stuff comes at me? You know how many people want to private message me? Do you know how many women? I mean, I I take my phone to my wife and I go, what in the world is this? Who is this person? She's from some other country and she's wanting to chat with me and she has no clothes on. Now, she's got a few threads on, but in my opinion, you don't need to be sending that to anybody who isn't married. You need to keep that stuff in the bedroom. I'm pastoring right now. I don't know what in the world's going on, man, but I'm sick and tired of the enemy letting letting people make decisions that are ruining not only their own lives, but it's going on down the line. And so if I fall into that temptation, it not only affects me, it affects Melissa, it affects Morgan, it affects Zoe, it affects all my staff members, and it affects all of you. You need to be careful about the decisions that you're making. Oh, this ain't going to bother nobody. Right. But then when it hits the newspaper, the church gets a black eye. Christianity gets a black eye. And every person who's against the church starts sharing it, starts putting it out there. My God, we need to shut the mouth of the lion. And the way you shut the mouth of the lion is you don't give him a place in your life. Don't make a decision that will allow him to run rampant over your life. I have a rule, I don't meet with women alone. And in today's day and age, I really don't want to meet with men alone. (laughs) The devil couldn't get you with with an accusation from a woman, he'll get you with an accusation from a man. Guard yourself, guard your heart, guard your mind, guard your spirit, guard your anointing, guard your family. So what they think you're a prude. I'd rather be an anointed prude than a backslidden preacher. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, if we want the divine outpouring of the Holy Ghost, it's going to come through holy sepulchers. We've already seen what happens. The picture of the decision of Adam and Eve. Oh, it won't matter. Really? You, well, <laughs> now you're out of your job. You lost your job. You got fired. Now you're unemployed. You have no clothes. You got nothing. 
And now, now that you have children, your boy, just one generation, your one boy had a murdering spirit to kill your other son. But what you do don't matter. Just one generation. Oh, yeah, but they had Seth. Well, but Seth means frail. It wasn't not the will of God. It was not the will of God. People say, oh, yeah, but they lived. But that wasn't the will of God for them to live like that. It wasn't the will of God for that to happen. So they make a decision. They neglected to exercise the authority that God had given them. Right? They had authority over everything that was in that garden. Where was that snake? He was in their garden. They had jurisdiction over that garden. And because they allowed that snake to stay in that tree and talk to them, they made a decision. You let the snake talk to you long enough, you'll start eating what he's dropping. Oh, here. I'll eat it. And here, Adam, you eat it. Now, Adam had authority. Eve had authority, so they're both violating their authority. And so then, because they gave up their authority, the enemy now has their authority. He has jurisdiction now in the garden. And now he uses that to intimidate it and use that, that authority, that power to intimidate Jesus. He is using it in Luke chapter 4. He's using that authority against Jesus. I'll give you this because this is really what you want, right? And uh, Jesus did not come to bow to Lucifer. He didn't come to worship Lucifer. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's a key word there, to seek and to save that which was lost. What was lost? Worship was lost. That which was lost. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So you were saved because you're the replacement worshipers. So this whole thing is a battle over worship. So he said, Jesus, if you'll bow down and you worship me, I'll give you this authority. I'll give you this power. Jesus like, I didn't come here to worship you. I came here to save them. And when I save them, they'll start worshiping me. And that makes the devil mad. So he's using the power and the authority to intimidate, to get Jesus to do something differently than what he was called and what he was born to do. So in reality, the enemy is saying, if you don't do what I want you to do, then you will not have any authority. Anybody ever had that thought go through your life? If you don't do what I want you to do, you're going to be nothing. If you don't do what I want you to do, see, I have all the authority. Now, I'm sure I'm not this way. Lord, help me if I am. But I'm sure there have been people in your life who have positions of authority who want you to do certain things. And if you don't do it, you fall out of favor with them. If you stand up for righteousness and speak truth to power, then all of a sudden you are ostracized and you're cast out. Can I tell you something in this church? If you see something ungodly, say something. I don't care who it is. I don't care who it is. I don't care what their name badge says. I don't care what seat they sit in. If you don't say something, there's trouble for them and there's trouble for all of us. You need to say something. You need to walk in your authority. And I know that's shocking. You're like, Woo, should we say something? If you don't say something, then their soul is in jeopardy and the success of the church is in jeopardy. If you don't say something, you have authority. They're, the believer has authority, not just the pastor. And I know all of you have been intimidated by this verse, right? Touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. Anybody ever heard that verse? Well, aren't you anointed? Aren't you anointed? Isn't there anointing on your life? So don't be touching the anointing. Don't, don't be using your power and your authority to touch the anointing, the anointed ones. Don't be lords over God's heritage. We're here to be servants. It's getting deep in here. So Jesus was baptized. Everybody remember Jesus being baptized? Jesus was baptized. And then they begin to describe who he was through his genealogy. Now, that described who he was naturally. And his natural birth line proved out that he could be king. He could be king naturally. But the enemy wasn't interested in who he could be naturally. He doesn't care what you do naturally. The enemy was interested what happened when Jesus was baptized and the enemy heard a voice that he'd heard before. Come on, there it is. <laughs> 
The enemy knew that voice because that was the voice that said, get out. You're out. And that voice, when Jesus was baptized in the water, the heavens opened, a dove descended, and a voice that the enemy recognized and heard, there was a voice that said, this is my son whom I am well pleased with. Now that caught the attention of Lucifer. Because now we're not talking about his genealogy naturally. Now we're talking about his genealogy spiritually. And when his spiritual father, not, not Joseph, his daddy on the earth, but when his spirit, his heavenly father said, this is my son whom I am well pleased with. That caught the ear of the enemy. And he's like, whoa, I better pay attention here. Uh, there's something different about this boy. He could be king naturally, but I'm not worried about what he's going to do naturally. I'm worried about what he's going to do spiritually. And when you get a call of God on your life and your Heavenly Father begins to speak over you. That's a voice that the enemy is listening to. And when God says he's pleased with you, the enemy is going to take you to the wilderness and he's going to start tempting you and intimidating you because he doesn't want the Father to be pleased with you. Hmm. I heard. So now I got to derail them and I got to compel them to do something differently to get them out of their place with God, that place of favor with God. And the enemy will do everything in his power to displace you and to distract you in order to try to regain the authority that was stripped from him by Jesus Christ. Now, I want to just walk you through uh, your place. Maybe this sounds rude to you, but uh, I want to put you in your place. All right, so let's all be rude. Look at your neighbor and say, I want to put you in your place. I want to put you in your... Now, some of you are getting a little anointed with that right now. I'm going to put you in your place. Mama said... Let, let, let me... You were the alarm clock and you woke them up. Now, now that you're awake, I want you to take your place. I want you to take your place. And your place isn't in a bar room. It's not in a drug house. No, your place is in the, the throne room of God. Your place is seated in heavenly places. You need to take your place. It's not at a Cardinals game. It's not at the Marion High School football game. That's cool that you went there. But your place is far above all the stuff that's going on in this earth. You're seated in heavenly places. Take your place. Let me read you a few verses. Psalm 91 verse 1. And he that dwelleth in the secret place, the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 18 verse 9. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Psalm 26 and verse 12. My foot standeth in an even place. In the congregations, I will bless the Lord. Now, the place that you occupy or you should be occupying as a believer can be lost. You can lose your place. Anybody ever been reading a book and lose your place? And the only reason why you remember that that wasn't the place is you're like, I think I've read this before. <laughs> That's the book of First Chronicles and Second Chronicles. Like, I think I lost my place. And then I look in the mirror and I found my place. I love it. Y'all do the same thing. You want to go to sleep, just go through the begettings and the begottens. And you be getting some sleep and begotten some rest. So you can lose your place. You can relinquish your rights to your place. And the enemy is trying to get your place. Right? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. So you have a position of authority and with authority, and you can give up your authority, you can give up your place, and most people give up their place and give up their authority because they don't really understand who they are. Maybe this is a good segue to, to the production team and the tech team and the marketing team. Maybe we'll do the power of salvation next week because this is a good segue to it. If you don't know what salvation brings into your life, you don't know who you are. And if you don't know who you are, then you don't really, you don't really treasure what you have. So if you don't have a clear understanding of who you are, what authority, then you'll not operate properly in the body of Christ. Judas Iscariot 
gave up his place. I don't think Judas had a clear understanding of just what exactly he could have been and who he was in Christ. He was the CFO of Jesus Christ Incorporated. He had no concept of who he was and, and what he was going to be. No, no concept of it. Even after he sold Jesus and he wanted to be repentant, he had sorrow, he still didn't understand who he was and who he was serving. Because I think Judas would be a better preacher about repentance than Peter. He could warn up Peter. Peter said, I did not even, Jesus said, I killed him. Peter said, I denied him three times. And Judas said, yeah, but I went and sold him. So I want to preach to you that you can sell him out, but yet you can still be saved. But Judas never got to preach that message because he didn't understand who he was and who he was serving. So he committed suicide because he didn't understand his place and his authority. He didn't have to sell Jesus. He didn't have to sell him out. He could have taken authority and said, no, I'm not going to do that. Instead, he's deterred. All right, Acts chapter 1, verse 20. It is, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation, place where he lives, be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. So Judas had all that. He had a habitation, and he had a ministry. Judas lost his place in ministry and lost his place in the spirit due to his transgression. Acts chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus, for he was numbered with us and obtained part of this ministry. He was a part of the ministry. He was numbered with us, but he didn't understand who he was and what his real role was. And so the primary way that the devil knocks people out of their place and out of their God-given authority is to convince them into transgression. That's how it all started in the book of Genesis. Now, I know everybody wants to talk about the blessings of the Lord and the Lord is my good buddy and the God is love. No, God is righteous first. Then God is love. And we'll talk about that with the apostle Paul begins with the righteousness of God. If God was just love, there would be no need for salvation. But because God is righteous, there is also a need for salvation. Now, I could be that seeker-friendly preacher and talk about how God's your good buddy. And, you know, if you text God, he'll text you back and all that good stuff. But I want to tell you, God's righteous. And if God is righteous, you need to be righteous. And the only way to be righteous is to be saved. And the only way to be saved, I might as well just go ahead and say this. For anybody watching who's thinking about maybe we come there to church and maybe there's another way to heaven. No, there's not. There's only one way to heaven, and it's through Jesus Christ. So transgression, that's how it started in, in the book of Genesis with Adam and Eve. He caused them to fall, got them into transgression, right? For all the people who want to follow the law, these cats couldn't keep one. They couldn't keep one. Don't eat of that tree. Thousands of other trees. And let's go back to the law. I grew up under the law and no one can keep it. That's the point of the law. Okay? You're never going to be holy for people who only believe in exterior holiness. But get some inward holiness and you're holy enough for God. So he causes them to fall. They dis, they're now they're displaced out of their relationship with God. My house is like a maze. It's like, really, it's more like an escape room. If you can escape it, you're doing good. There's gates everywhere. Winston's crazy. He, the dogs take on the person out of the owners. He's got all kinds of energy, and he's like, I love everybody, and I just want to see everybody. And Marlo and Lucy are like, I hate that thing, because before he got here, we could run wherever we wanted to go. We could sleep with mom and dad. We could get treats. We didn't have all this stuff. We could go outside whenever we wanted to. I didn't have somebody biting my ear. I didn't have, and what's happened is, is two of our dogs who had always gotten along, and Marlo was alpha dog, and Lucy was like, whatever you want to do, man. And now 
now that Winston's involved in it, now all of a sudden two people who were originally getting along, now Lucy is turning on Marlo because she's trying to establish her place in the line of authority. It was never in question before, but now there's a question. So th this is exactly what happened. There was little Bo Peep and his sheep were out there and they were minding their own business. And all of a sudden they had no idea that Adam and Eve had ate an apple and they were just laying next to Mr. Wolfman and they were like, hey buddy, we're gonna go out and we're gonna hang out. We're gonna go watch a movie together. And out of nowhere, Mr. Wolfman takes a bite out of the lamb. And he's like, what are you doing? He's like, I don't know. It's just something come over me. See, the lion and the lamb could always lay down together, but because somebody else didn't walk in their authority and somebody else made a decision, it now affects people who had no idea what was even going on. And they're like, what are you doing? I had no idea. We were friends. And if you look at our world right now, people are going crazy against one another. It's because people are making the wrong decisions and they're not taking their authority. We would not have racism if the church would take authority over it because we were brothers all along, but somehow they want to divide us and cause us to war against one another. Is that not a prey out of the enemy's playbook? And that's why we have got to take authority over it. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 25. This is a pro prophecy about the coming Jerusalem. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock and the dust, even then, even in the new heavens and the new earth, the snake still has to eat dust. One ate my mower blade yesterday. <laughs> and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. So Isaiah is saying there's going to be a restoration. That lion and that lamb and that wolf are going to be able to lay down together. And they're going to be able to hang out. And Marlon and Lucy and Winston will one day get along in the new heavens and the new earth. <clears throat> so a man forfeited his authority. I'm jumping way down in the notes. A man forfeited his authority. And because a man forfeited it, a man had to be the one who could restore it. Now, thousands of years before the fall of Adam, or excuse me, thousands of years after the fall of Adam, in a manger, there was a little baby born, and his name was, well, some of you knew it, uh, and his name was, all right, just want to make sure. His name is Jesus. And that baby was not part man and part God. His name was Emmanuel, meaning God revealed in man. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. Not part God, all God. God with us. And the fact that he was a man... Gave him the legal right to regain what was lost at the fall. But because he was the son of God, that exempted him from the lordship that the enemy had over man. So everything that Jesus did revealed the will of God. Everything that he said revealed the will of God. Sins were forgiven in his presence because they did not have dominion in his presence. Sickness and disease had to bow and flee because they did not have dominion in his presence because of his authority and power. Now, listen, I, this may shock you, but when we get to heaven, we're not going to go into some sort of chemotherapy to be delivered from cancer. He's not going to have a cure. He is the cure. His glory is the cure of it. It cannot exist in his presence. It, there, there's not a disease. There's not a sickness. There's not a sin. There's not an infirmity that can stand in his presence, it has to flee. Right? Jesus shows up on the shoreline and there's a, a demonic man, we call him the man of the Gadarenes, and more revelation comes from the demons than any of the human beings around there. As soon as Jesus shows up on the shoreline, the demons realize we can't even stay on this place because Jesus has showed up. I want Jesus to show up in this room that every disease and sickness and infirmity realizes that when you're at Purpose House, you're on holy ground and it cannot
cannot stay here and it flees your body right from the top of your head to the soles of your feet everything has to go in the name and the presence of Jesus Christ Luke chapter 5 verse 20 and when he saw their faith he said unto him man thy sins are forgiven thee and the scribes and the Pharisees begin to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Hello. <laughs> and then when Jesus perceived their thoughts, I mean, he's getting ready to, I mean, he just forgave sins, and they're like, Only God alone can do that. And then only God alone can perceive thoughts, because only God knows the thoughts and the intentions of your heart. And he answered to them and said, what reason you in this in your hearts? Whether it's easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. And he said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that wherein he lay and departed to his own house glorifying God. So everything was under his authority. Sin was under his authority. Sickness was under his authority. Nature itself was under his authority. He saith in Matthew chapter 8, Why are you fearful, ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? So, Lord, I just speak to that tropical storm that's in Florida right now and hold it up. My whole staff is going to Florida this week, leaving me. They're all gone, but Lord bless them. But in all seriousness, we have like six or seven of our staff members on planes flying to Florida and there's a whatever that's going to be out there. So I'm praying a hedge of protection around about them. So Jesus was a walking, talking display of the authority that Adam once held on the earth. And Jesus was restoring the authority that Adam had relinquished at his fall. Not only did Adam lose his authority, but he was displaced in his relationship with God. And that was uh, the main purpose of Christ, was to come and through authority, restore the relationship of God and man. To restore relationship between us and God. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came and told his disciples, he said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He said, I have been given all authority. And it's the same word as power in Luke chapter 4, the same word, exusa. I've been given authority there jurisdiction here and then he told his disciples because of this go therefore and that's the connection between our calling and his authority our calling is to go therefore and do what exercise authority how many of you and your parents ever left the house they put you in charge i was the youngest by age and so they never did this to me but my parents would always put one of my older sisters in charge. And I'm like, really? <laughs> You're in charge. That means everything falls on you. Sweet. We burned fields down. <laughs> we caught cats and did things that we have to ask for forgiveness for. And then when they would say, I'd say, hey, Jody was in charge. Jody was in charge. So what the enemy wants to do now, because Jesus has authority, is he commits all these atrocities and then says, well, look who's in charge. Well, I thought the church was in charge. So he commits all these atrocities and then puts it on us that it's our fault. Like acts of God. Well, was there hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, raging fires? Was there any of that in the Garden of Eden? Man's sin created all of this. And a man who is not in relationship with God will have storms in his life that are uncontrollable too. A man outside of relationship with God 
is given to his sinful ways. See, people say all the time, I don't know what kind of a person I would be if it wasn't for Christ. Well, I do. I do. I would be an alcoholic because that runs in my family. I would be obese because that runs in my family. All those things run in my family. So I know what kind of a person I would be if I was out of relationship with God. I would not have any self-control. That's the person I would be. And because now I'm in relationship with Christ, God gives me authority to not be the man that the enemy wanted me to be. But I have to walk in that authority every day of my life. See, there's people who want to argue with me about alcohol. You're not going to get me to drink. I don't even have Bible enough to back up how I feel about it. I just know I'm not going to tempt the Lord thy God. And the Lord has allowed that thing to be stopped in my life. And I'm not attracted to or addicted to alcohol. So why would I even tempt it? I have to make a decision to stay in the authority that God has given to me. You have to make decisions, whether it be whatever it may be. Mine's alcohol. I don't watch horror films because I'm a scaredy cat of the dark. Okay? I want to be able to see a hockey mask and not run the other direction. Okay? I don't want to, just because your name is Fred, I don't want to be afraid of you. I, I, I'm going to buy a house on Elm Street one day. So I, I just do that for me. Now, that's not a church doctrine. But that's me making a decision because I'm in relationship with God not to put anything there that would cause me to doubt my God. You need to be careful. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19, verses 23, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? What is his exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and he set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and he gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Okay, notice in verse 20, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places plural places now Ephesians chapter 2 that I just read to you Ephesians chapter 1 I ended in verse 23 go to the next chapter Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 wherein in time past we walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience then in verse 6 and he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus the place where the children of God are to dwell is not according to the prince of the power of the air, but the place where the children of God are to dwell is in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Our affection, our mindsets, our thoughts are to be on things above and not things here. We're not to be seated in those places. We are to be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And if you are a redeemed individual, then you need to understand that your place is above it. Your place is above whatever it is that you're facing, that the enemy is bringing to you. Your place is above it. Above it. You're above it. Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said to them, I beheld Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over, over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So you're rejoicing because your name is written in heaven because you're in relationship with God. You have authority over those things that are coming against you. And we spend so much time glorying in the fact that we have authority over the enemy, but we forget that the reason why we have that authority over the enemy is because we're now in relationship with God. Because if you try to tangle with those scorpions and those things that sting you and harm you and you're not in relationship with God, you're going to be like the sons of Sceva and the enemy is going to beat you senseless. 
So the most important thing is to remain in right relationship with God. To remain in right relationship with God. Don't fall asleep in your relationship with God. Don't snooze on it. Stay in relationship with God. So if your place is to be in relationship with God, if you're in the throne room of God, right, Romans chapter 5, we have access to God, we have peace to God, we can enter into his throne room boldly. Let me ask you, how many of you would sin if you were in the throne room of God? Would you be carrying on that conversation if you were in the throne room of God? I love all these people. Well, if Jesus shows up, Jesus already showed up and he's already there and he already knows what you're doing. So I'm asking you, why are you doing it? Can you imagine what kind of church services we would have if we were already entertaining Jesus all week long? The anticipation that would have, so you have to remain there. It's not just a Sunday thing. We've, listen, church, those of you online, I think we've had enough of Sunday Christians. I think, I think we've had enough of people saying, well, I go to church. That doesn't make you saved. I play golf. That doesn't make me Tiger Woods. He was born with something. And you were born with something too when you're born again. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Start getting my sermon earlier. You keep moving around. You'll be here through, until midnight. So how many of y'all know you have a place? You have a place. It's to be seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, a secret place, an even place. So don't give your place to the devil. That's what Peter said, because Peter was well aware what happens when you get intimidated. This is Peter who is saying, Lord, I'll die for you. And a waitress intimidated him and he denied him. So Peter knew the results of being intimidated. And Peter was the one that wrote to us and said, I don't want you to go down the same road I went down. I denied him three times and I went back to fishing because I thought all hope was lost. And you don't have to make that lonely walk from Jerusalem to the Sea of Galilee with the last thought you had is that I denied Christ. Peter's saying, don't give place to that. Don't give him an inch. Don't give him any room, right? You would think that when Peter heard Jesus say, he said, by the time the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. You would think the first time he did it, he'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. that's the first one. But once the enemy has you intimidated, the first one is the hardest one. The second one is easier. And by the third time, it just comes out your mouth. Don't give place to the devil. Don't give any room to him. Now, you may think that some of our rules here at the church are crude or coarse. But I know what it's like to question my calling because my pastor fell. I had to go ask a fallen man, did God really call me or did you have a plan for me? And it took years for me to work through those thoughts and those emotions. My wife is here. And she, there were times where I would get up and I would be like, I don't think I'm called by God. And she's like, why? Well, well, because I can't figure out because of what he did and how it affected me. And so I put things in my life right now so that there's not a young man coming up behind me that has to say, I wonder, was that really a word from God or was that just him? Because look at him now. You have to live your life thinking that every decision you make doesn't just affect you. Every decision you make affects others. I remember one time we took eight cars to lunch here at church. And we got to the lunch house and everybody was like, man, that was crazy. And I'm like, yep. But because of the way it worked out, we all had to drive separately because we would not allow a male staff member and a female staff member to drive in the same car together. 
alone. And so we all drove our own cars to lunch. Because that's crazy. Yeah, well, I'm not giving place to the devil. If you're in rooms by yourself, don't give place to the devil. It's funny, we had this conversation before church. Somebody said, you're going to put couches in those rooms. And I said, we don't buy couches here. We have a couch in your room. There's a couch in my office that nobody sits on except Winston. And there's a couch outside in a glass room. Why? Because we're not going to give place to the devil. So I'm saying to you is this. When you start backing up off of your authority, and when you start just, well, that's no big deal. The enemy is inching his way in to destroy what God's trying to do. Call me a prude. Call me whatever you want. Holier than now. That's old school. Well, you know what? The old school is pretty good. We were a whole lot better off when we were in the old school than this stuff where we have litter boxes in the school. So when the enemy, right, Peter is saying to us, he said, neither give place to the devil. He said, your enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so, sir, ma'am, when the enemy comes to devour you, he's not just trying to devour you, but he's also trying to devour your family, your marriage, your peace. He's trying to devour every bit of that. So when the enemy is on the prowl, he's looking to go after those who, if they fall to his temptation, would influence the most by their fall. And one of his greatest targets are those who are in leadership. And if he can force leadership into failure, then he makes every person who is feeding in that garden vulnerable. The animals were minding their own business, and Adam's fall caused them to have a problem. People could be minding their own business. For me, I was literally in the car driving the general superintendent of the, one of the largest organizations that I had ever known. I was driving him to the airport. I was on a spiritual and natural high. Dropped him off, dropped his suitcase off, and I got a phone call. Your pastor's just been arrested. And my world turned up, sad, down. So when the enemy comes after you, he only doesn't get you, but he gets a lot of people underneath it who live the rest of their lives trying to figure out why. It's because we gave up our authority and we gave an occasion for the enemy to use us to destroy people underneath us. When a tree falls, it damages everything on the ground underneath it. So be careful of your decisions. Walk in your authority and do not give up your place to the enemy. So when David was supposed to be at war, it was the season of war. And instead of going to war, David says, I'd rather stay home. Idle hands are where the enemy loves to play. And so if you are supposed to be in ministry and you're supposed to be living out your purpose and your destiny and you're not doing it now, can I tell you something? You are a target. Because the sin wasn't just Bathsheba. He went so far as to murder his best friend to cover it up. Wouldn't it have been better if David would have just went to war? And just fulfilled his purpose. There's some of you that are on the sidelines and you need to get back on the battle lines and walk in your authority. And then there's going to be those that say, well, what if I've done this? What if I've messed up? Here's the beautiful thing. We're on the other side of the cross. And God can restore you. And God can use you. There's one thing that the Lord allows me to do as the senior pastor of this church and that he allows me to operate in the ministry of restoration. 
because the gifts and the calling are without repentance. And I've watched men who have fallen and people make them a pariah. And we Christians, we love to tar and feather who make people who make mistakes. Why don't you start handling people the way you would want to be handled if you had a failure? And so if you're in this place and you think, well, man, he was preaching right at me. No, I'm preaching for you. For you to take your place of authority, your place in God, your place in ministry, and don't give place to the devil. I stay busy. One of the biggest dangers that I have is in my own life, my weakness is an unoccupied mind. I'm not tempted by women. I'm not tempted by money. Where the enemy gets me is with an unoccupied mind. And so I have to keep my mind busy. Keep my mind moving. Because if I allow my mind to go, I'm like, what am I doing in Southern Illinois? There's no airport here. There's... So I have to keep my mind. I'm just being honest with you. If I allow him, he'll convince me out of my place. I've had people come up and tell me, you and Pastor Melissa, you're just too big for Southern Illinois. What was that supposed to mean? And then I go home and I think about that. And I think about that. And I'm like, what is that supposed to mean? I'm like, why is it Southern Illinois? Why, why can't they have something big? See, you got to guard the area where the enemy likes to attack you. And for me, it's an unoccupied mind. So I read. I stay busy. I study by mowing my yard. I study because I, I, if I sit down, my brain goes in a thousand different directions. I can't shut my brain off. What area do you need to guard against so that you can stay in your place? So with every head bowed, with every eye closed. Father, today I want your Holy Spirit to speak to every life and every heart. For those, Lord, that have been displaced out of their place of authority and their position in ministry, Lord, I'd ask today that there would be a restoration that would come. Lord, as they reconcile themselves to you and with you, Remind them, Lord, that your word says that a man's gift will make room for itself. Their gift, their place, their destiny, it will make room. I pray, Lord, that we would put up fences and guardrails. We would do everything within our power to guard against the onslaught of the enemy against our hearts and our minds and our souls. And Lord, let the, the word that Paul wrote to the church at Rome come into our lives. Let us not be conformed to the things of this world, but rather let us be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And may our minds be renewed. May our ministries be restored. And may we take our rightful place and walk in and exercise the authority that you have given to us. In Jesus' name. So if you would, would you stand with me across the room? Our prayer teams are going to come. I love this house. I love what God's doing in this house. But I love God more than anything. I love the Lord more than anything. And I want that to be your heart's desire too. I love the Lord more than anything. More than anything, I want to be pleasing to Him. I'm serving to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I brought them forward, and if you need restoration in any area of your life, whether that be in your health, whether that be in ministry, whether that be in your marriage, your finances, in your family, with your children, that's what I want this moment to be about right now. If you need restoration in any area of your life, you need something to be restored, something that has been taken from you that you won't restore back, then this altar is open for you. There's no judgment in this house. We have no Pharisees here. And we have no Sadducees here. We have real people of God in this house. 
So as Pastor Melissa sings, you make your way wherever you are. If you're online, you would like to send me something privately. It's Pastor J at PurposeHouseChurch.org, and I promise you I'll read it and I'll respond. But just, just for a moment, if you would now across the room where people are coming, if you just lift your hands to the Lord, and I want you to surrender everything out to Him. Heavenly Father, sweep over this place. Thank you again for tuning into the Purpose House Church YouTube channel. When you're on site here, we do a three-week challenge asking you to come to any and all of our services for three weeks, and we believe that you would find your new church home. But now that you're online, I'm asking you to do the three-click challenge. Click the subscribe button, click the like button, and click the share button. By liking and sharing our video, you're helping us fulfill our purpose of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. Then if you would, in the comment section, please let me know where you're watching from and if there is anything that we can pray with you about in your life. Thank you again for tuning in to the Purpose House Church YouTube channel, and I look forward to seeing you again real soon.